Well, good morning, everybody, on this Easter Sunday. And we just want to give you greetings in the name of our Lord and Jesus, Jesus Christ. And uh, now, normally we do something on Easter that um, is a kind of response back and forth. And so I'm going to say, He is risen, and you have to say, He is risen indeed. And I know it's going to feel a little weird sitting at home, but you do this for me, all right? I'm going to say, He is risen, and you respond, He is risen indeed. Here we go. He is risen. All right, he is risen indeed, and I am so thankful that he is, in fact, risen. And for this Easter Sunday, as I was seeking God's direction as to what we should, uh, what you'd have for me to share this morning, I uh, began thinking about what it would have been like to, to walk this earth with Jesus when he was here walking on the earth. And have you ever imagined what that would have been like to actually see how Jesus, uh, hear his voice, hear him speak, and it, scripture tells us that everywhere he went and everywhere he spoke, I mean, crowds just gathered around him. And uh, something about his voice drew people, drew a crowd. And I would love to hear, have heard him speak. And then to, to see him heal somebody that was blind and to heal a leper. And I mean, just imagine all the different miracles that he did as he walked on this earth to actually see those. But we have God's word, which is the living word. And, uh, and, we have those stories, which is incredible. But this morning, we're going to use our imagination this morning. So I need you to put your thinking cap on, your imagination, as we go back in the life of Jesus, as the days that he walked on this earth. And we're going to look at his, his life in the perspective of Simon Peter, one of his disciples. I can remember the day that I met Jesus. Man, it, was a, it had been a long night. My buddies and I had been fishing all night long. It's what we did for a profession. We were fishermen by trade. It's how we made a living. And we had fished all night long and had caught nothing. Now, it's one thing to go fishing for fun and you don't catch anything, how disappointing that is. But to, when it's your profession, that's your job, you're supposed to be good at fishing, if that's your job, and we go all night long, we don't catch a thing. That's pretty discouraging, let me tell you. And we came in as... As the sun rose that morning, we came in and we were cleaning our nets. And I'll tell you, the spirits were very low that morning. Not only were we exhausted physically, mentally, we were just down because we didn't catch anything. And we were cleaning our nets and whatnot. We're not really saying a whole lot. And all of a sudden we heard the crowd coming and this man was kind of in the center. We could hear him speaking and I'd never seen him before. And... The crowd kept pressing around him, and finally he got so close that he ended up getting into our boat. And I'm like, dude, what's your problem? What are you doing here? And he looked at me and said, hey, push away from shore a little. And I'm like, all right, who are you? <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll do that. So we pushed away from shore, and he began to teach. And I don't know, there was just something about his voice that it just captivated me. And, and obviously the crowd was captivated too because just more people just kept coming. And it was obvious that I knew why he had asked us to push away from shore because, I mean, people were standing right at the shoreline and getting as close as they possibly could to him. And we just sat and, and listened. And as he spoke, he, it got to the point where he looked at me and he said, hey, you push out into the deep and cast your nets into the water. And... I'll be honest, I didn't know who this guy was. And first of all, I'm the fisherman. I don't know who he is. I don't know what his background is, but I'm the professional fisherman here. And I fished all night long in that spot. Let me tell you, there's, they're not biting, okay? It's a waste of time. We were there all night long. But we did it. Those are the things I was thinking. I didn't say it. And we pushed out from shore, and we or pushed out farther into the deep, and we cast our nets into the water, and... I want to tell you, my eyes about popped out of my head because our nets became so full of fish, I have never seen this happen. And my buddies, James and John, and their father, Zebedee, were in the other boat, and we had to call to them to help us pull it in because our ship was about ready to sink. It was too much, way too much. And we're like, hey, James and John, get over here. Bring your ship over here, your boat over here. We need your help. And they helped us. And I fell down at this man's feet, and I... I said, you've got to get out of here because I'm not worthy to be in your presence. There's, there's something special about you. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget this. He said, from now on, you're going to be fishers of men. Fishers of men? 
What does that mean? Am I like casting out nets and trying to catch people? Like, what does that even mean? Fishers of men? But something still, it just, okay, well, maybe, maybe I should see what he's about. Who is this guy? And he told us to follow him. Leave everything behind and follow. And so we did. We followed him. James, John, Andrew, and several others that we grew up with. There was a total of 12 of us that followed Jesus everywhere he went. And through the next several weeks, he just went around. He taught everywhere he went. There was a, a crowd. And he taught on the mountain. And, and it just was incredible seeing the crowds come in and that were willing to sit and listen. And I don't know. And he spoke with such authority that we'd never heard before. And I don't know. It was just it was incredible. Well, as we were coming back into town one night, a man that was a leper, you know, and leper, lepers were supposed to be excluded from the area. They had to go live in their own separate area. And this leprous man came running to Jesus. And my first natural instinct was to, whoa, get out of here. Whoa, unclean. Don't touch me. Don't get even close to me. I mean, that stuff's contagious. And Jesus didn't move. And the guy fell down on his feet and he said, I believe that if... You will, can, that you can heal me. And, and Jesus, I saw a smile come across his face. And he's like, I, I do. Be healed. And the man's leprosy departed. Incredible. I, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I had to like pinch myself and then ask James to make sure he saw the same thing. And he, in fact, saw it. And I was like, I can't believe that. I've never seen anything like that. It was incredible. Not only was he excellent speaker and people just came to listen but he he healed the leper and then he healed someone that was blind i could not the miracles i could go on and on and on but we don't have time to talk about all the miracles that jesus did but one day i remember we were specific we were in this in a group we were just talking and it was a normal day and we loved just talking together and and teasing each other and all of a sudden, one of the disciples of John the Baptist, which is Jesus' cousin, came running up to Jesus and said, Jesus, Jesus, John the Baptist has been beheaded by Herod. and he, he's, he's dead. And, I mean, we couldn't believe it. There, John the Baptist? There's no way. He would want to kill John the Baptist. I mean, he was an, an incredible man, a God-fearing man. He did incredible things. And it was obvious that God's presence was with him. And why would anybody want to kill him? And it was Jesus' cousin as well. And, and Jesus was always the, the guy that cheered everyone else up. And he always had a smile on his face. And, and, but yeah, I saw his countenance change. And he looked at us and he said, let's, let's, let's go to, let's get out of here. And so we got into the ship and we went to this, really, in the middle of nowhere. This place in the middle of nowhere. And as we were there... People had heard that we had left, and they followed us on foot. And they started coming, and my natural instinct was like, get out of here. Do you, you don't know what Jesus is going through. He wants to be alone right now. And just leave him alone. Leave him alone. But Jesus was, felt sorry for him because there was people that were having, they were having a need that they couldn't walk or different ones that were, just had needs that needed met. And Jesus had compassion on them. And he began touching them and, and healing them. And then he began to teach. And like always, a crowd grew. And, and he began to, and just kept talking and speaking. And before we knew it, we had at least 5,000 people. Were, men were there, not counting their wives and children. Let me tell you, families are big back in my day. And so it was incredible, the amounts of people. And Jesus spoke for hours. And it came, it was getting evening. And we're like, Jesus, you need to wind this down. You need to conclude it because these people need to go home and get some supper. Because I know my stomach's been talking to me for a little long, for a little while. And we don't hardly have enough money to pay for food for us. We don't have enough money to get McDonald's for us. So we got to send these people home so they can go and get food for themselves and have a good evening together. All right. But Jesus looked at us and was like, why don't you feed them? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what are we going to feed them with? I mean, we just told you we barely have enough food for ourselves, let alone 15, 20,000 people. What are you thinking? And one of the disciples, one of the guys found a little boy that had a little sack lunch and he was about ready to bite into it. And he asked him if he could have, have it. And the kid's like, what? I want my lunch. But thankfully he, he gave, he's like, well, Jesus needs it. And the kid's like, oh, okay. And so Brought the lunch to Jesus, and there was only five loaves and two little fish. Like, I mean, puny-looking fish. And, and Jesus, this is all we have. 
And that didn't seem to bother him because he looked up into heaven, he blessed the food, and then he began to just break it off. He said, he looked at us, he's like, put all the people in groups of 50 and start handing out food. He's like, Lord, um, that's barely enough ki- food for the kid to eat and get full. How are we going to feed all these people? But as we kept delivering the food to people, we kept coming back to Jesus for more, and there was more. So we kept taking it, kept taking it. Before long, everybody was so full, they wanted to roll down the hill. And, and we ended up packing 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, there was so much more after the meal that we had from the very beginning. Tell me, that's a miracle. Like, there, that just doesn't happen. That was incredible. Well, then, after that, Jesus told us, he sent the multitudes away. He said, you guys go ahead and get to your ship. Go to the other side. You go ahead of me. I need to stay back, and I'm going to send the multitude away, and I'm, I want to go pray. And so we're like, okay. So we went to the ship, and sailing is very normal for us. So we got to the ship. It's a beautiful evening. Beautiful. The waters were just perfect. And we were sailing. There was a nice, nice breeze. Oh, it was incredible. Well, something that happens a lot in our area, in the Sea of Galilee, storms come out of nowhere. That happened, happened that night. And I'm telling you, this was one of the worst storms I've been in. And I'm a professional sailor, okay? I know what I'm doing. And I was fearing for my life. I didn't want to tell the other guys that, but we were all thinking the same thing. And we were bailing some water. The water was coming in faster than we could get out of the ship. And we were throwing over things overboard that we didn't need. And I tell you what, we were afraid. There was no hope. But then, and this is the middle of the night, okay? I mean, this is like probably three in the morning. Then all of a sudden we started seeing something or someone was out on the water. Now, it had been a long day. We'd been with a lot of people, and I thought I was just seeing things. But then this thing that was out there said, fear not. Are you kidding me? Fear not. We're in the middle of the storm. We're about ready to die. And now there's this ghost that's walking out on the water, and he's talking to me. How am I not supposed to be afraid? But he says, fear not, it is I. And I don't know what came over me, but for whatever reason, I don't have a filter, okay? And I just said, hey, if it's you, Jesus, tell me to come out there. And he said, come. And I was like, boy, he answered that really fast. I really hope it is Jesus. And so I, Peter, I stepped out of the boat. Now, I cannot describe to you what that felt like. Never done that before. Never done it since. But I actually walked on the water. Now, the storm was still raging. And I was walking on the water. I was like, <laughs> did you see this? Guys, did you see this? Now, they were still bailing water. They didn't really pay attention to what I was doing. But I was walking on the water. And I was pretty amazed. I was like, Jesus, you see this? I'm, I'm standing on the water like you. And then all of a sudden, this a massive wave started coming up over here. I was like, uh-oh, there's no way I'm going to survive that. And immediately I began sinking. Now, I don't know how you sink, but I sink really fast, all right? But as soon as I started sinking, I cried out for God, for Jesus to save me. And he was there. Now, I had so, he was over there, but then he was immediately there with his hand pulling me up out of the water. And then he walked with me back to the ship. That was an incredible moment that me and him... And then when we stepped into the boat is when the, the, the storm calmed. What an incredible thing. And I was like, man, even, you, you can even walk on the water and you can calm the storms? Man, there's, there's just something about you. It's just incredible. It's incredible. I don't know, something about Jesus. I just wanted to always be next to him. I didn't want to leave his side. Well, as time progressed, we... As I said, I, have, I could tell story after story about the different ones that we came in contact with and that Jesus healed. And I mean, it's just an unbelievable. And how he, how he taught and, and got the scribes and Pharisees all confused. Oh, it was priceless. You should have seen it. Oh, he always left them speechless. They, didn't, they were always trying to trick him. And oh man, he could twist things all on them. And they were so confused. And they left being all embarrassed. It was great. It was awesome. I loved it. Oh, it was great. I wish I could have shown you that. Oh, it was great. But anyhow, as time progressed, Jesus started like saying some weird things. And, and, um, but one in particular, he sat us down one night and he was saying, who do people, who do people say I am? And I was like, um, you're Jesus. I mean, we all know that. And Jesus of Nazareth, we call you that. And, um, but what do they say? Who am I? And people are like, well, I mean, some say you're 
Elijah, and other, maybe others say you're Jeremiah, and maybe others say you're just any other prophet. And then he's like, well, who do you say I am? And the others were just kind of quiet, and I'm normally one of the first ones to speak. But I just kind of been thinking, I, was like, I mean, what, where, what's he getting at? And, and I finally just like, came to the conclusion, I believed it with all my heart. I was like, you're, you're not just Jesus, you're, you're the Christ, you're son of the living God. And I believed that with all my heart. And Jesus looked at me, and I'll never forget that look in his eyes. He smiled. He said, blessed are you, Simon. And he said, I'm going to call you Peter. You know what Peter means? It means rock. You're solid. He's like, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. I had no idea what he was talking about, but that sounded cool. I mean, Jesus called me rock. I'm rock solid. He's somebody I, he can depend on. Not some wishy-washy person. He's somebody that's always going to be there for him. And that's who I was. I was proud of that. Jesus called me a rock. He could depend on me. And somehow, some way, he was going to use me in the future, and I had no idea what that meant. But I was, I was pretty happy about it. Well, as time progressed, Jesus started talking about like he was going to be betrayed and, and, and killed, and then he was going to rise again. And he said it in riddles, and I was like, I didn't really know what that meant. I was like, Lord, you, you need to get some more sleep. You've been around too much people. And, but he, he would just do it at random times. We really didn't understand well, then it came time that it was, he said, when we go into Jerusalem, this is going to happen. So we were heading into Jerusalem one time, and it was close to the Passover time, which was an exciting, exciting for, our, for the Jewish people. And a lot of just excitement in the streets. You can just feel it. You can just feel it as you come into Jerusalem. And as we were coming in, we weren't there yet. We were still a little ways off. Um, he looked to a couple of the other guys, and he said, hey, I want you to go into this village, and there you're going to find a donkey tied up. And it's never had any rider on it, I want you to take that donkey, no, untie him from the post, and bring him to me. And if anybody says, hey, what are you doing? You say, hey, the master needs his donkey. And so they did that. I was kind of glad it wasn't my assignment, because that sounded really awkward. But they went. And everything that Jesus said happened. They found the donkey, and they went and unhitched it, and the master was like, hey, what are you doing my donkey? And they're like, oh, the master needs, oh, yeah, take it, whatever. We'll, we'll catch up later with you, and we'll get, the, get it back. Okay. No problem. All right, so they brought the donkey back to Jesus. And, and Jesus got up on the donkey. And as we were coming into Jerusalem, the people started, like, cutting off palm branches. And they started waving them. And, and some even took off their coats. And they started laying them down the, on the ground in, in front of the donkey. And, and they were crying out, saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he that is come in the name of the Lord. And I was like, what is happening? Now, Jesus, you were talking about being betrayed when you came to Jerusalem. I don't see any betrayal. I mean, why would anybody betray you? Everywhere you go, there's a crowd. Everybody loves you. Everywhere you go, you, you're touching people's needs and, and you're healing the sick. Why would anybody want to do anything to hurt you? What are you talking about? And now these people are worshiping you, praising you. And I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. I get to be a part of this. Yeah, I'm his buddy. I'm his pal. I go everywhere with him. Yeah, and to thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. Yes. I'm, yes. Yeah. Good citizen right there. All right. And so people were just worshiping him, and it was, it was an incredible moment. And that day, like I said, it was it, just the excitement of the Passover. There was so much excitement through that week. And, and as the days progressed, it was getting closer and closer to Passover feast. And, and Jesus kept talking about this betrayal. And, Still, the disciples, we just kind of scratched our head. We just thought he was just, I don't know, crazy. And a few days, as it was time for the Passover feast, he looked over at Peter, or John and I, and, and uh, he said, hey, go ahead and prepare the Passover feast. And we're like, uh, sure thing, Lord, but um, where do you want to do it? And he's like, well, you're going to go into town, and you're going to see this man carrying a pitcher. Now, you follow that man. Don't make it awkward or anything. Yeah, keep your distance, social distancing there. And, and you go and you follow him to the household that he's working. And you go to the master of the house and you tell the master of the house that the Lord needs a place for the Passover feast. And they're going to lead you to this upper room that is going to be exactly what we need, the size that we need for, our, for the, all the disciples and I. And so John and I, we went to town and we're like, oh, John, you got your eyes peeled for a glass of water or a pitcher of water? He said, yeah, I got my eyes peeled. So we found a guy that was carrying a pitcher of water. He was like, I hope this is the right guy. So we followed this guy, kind of kept a little bit off to make sure he didn't feel awkward and we weren't like being weird or anything, creeping on him. And so we followed him to this house and we went to the master of the house and said, hey, um, I know, don't know you, but um, we follow four disciples of Jesus. And he's, 
he's needing a place for the Passover feast. And so, oh, perfect. We have just the right room for you. And so he led us to this upstairs room. And it was exactly how Jesus had described it. And we did everything that we needed to do to prepare for the, for the feast. And then Jesus came and all the other disciples. And we came and sat down. But something was, was different about Jesus that night. He seemed cons- concerned a little bit. He seemed troubled. And uh, we're like, what's, what's up with Jesus? Do you know what's going on? And like, no, I don't, I don't know. And I was hoping maybe you knew. No, I, I don't know. And as we sat down, and he started talking about the bread was like his body that was going to be break, broken. And then this cup that we were to drink of was like the blood, his blood that was going to be shed for us. And we're like, Lord, this is weird. I've never had a Passover feast like this. What, what's going on? And then he started talking about this betrayal thing again. And, and him being killed. And like, Lord, finally I just had enough of this. And like, Lord... Did you not see this week how you came into the city on the donkey, how people were praising you and worshiping you? And everywhere you go, you have a crowd of followers that were just that they you don't hardly ever have a time for yourself because they're always there. Like, why would anybody betray you? And then he looked at me and he said, Peter, Satan wants you. (laughs) Okay, he's he said Satan wants you and he wants to sift you as wheat. And, but don't worry, I've, I've prayed for you. I was like, okay, interesting. Lord, uh, I appreciate your prayers. I mean, it's one thing for somebody to pray for you, but to hear the master, Jesus, say he's praying for me, that was, but I didn't know what he was talking about. Satan wants me. What, what, what is he talking about? And then he, I told him, I was like, and he was talking about the death again. I was like, Lord, I will do anything for you. I would even go to prison with you. I'd, you know what? I'd even go to death. I'd die for you. And Jesus looked at me. He said, before the rooster crows tomorrow, you're going to deny that you even knew me three times. And I'll tell you what, I was insulted because I consider Jesus my best friend. Okay, I went everywhere with him. I had walked on the water with him. None of the other disciples did. I had walked on the water with him. I was the guy that he called a rock. He, I was the guy that Jesus said he could depend on. That I was always there for him. And to say that I'm going to deny that I even know him? Like, and he said it in front of all the guys. Like, come on, Lord. Like, if you're going to say something like that, say it just between me and you. But to, that, that's, that kind of hurts. It kind of embarrassed me in front of the, all the guys. And I was just kind of puzzled. Like, Lord, I would never do that. So we finished our, our meal and we left that evening and Judas had to leave early and Lord said something weird about him even, but we thought, and then he got up and left, but and he kind of took care of the money, so we just kind of figured he had to go pay for whatever our Passover feast was, so we didn't really think anything of it. And then we left and we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is very a, a place that we went very often. And as we came into the garden, you could see that his, his troubled spirit would, had not gone away. He, he was burdened about something. And he said that the couple of the other disciples laid down earlier on as we entered into the garden. And James and John and I, we went on a little further into the garden. And he looked at us and said, pray that you not enter into te- temptation. I'm like, temptation of what? Mm, okay. So he told us to pray. So we began to pray. And Jesus went on farther into the garden. Not very far, but we could kind of see a silhouette. Distant, it was dark, and it was, it was night, of course. And, but I don't know what happened or came over us, but all of a sudden, James over there was snoring like a pig. I mean, he was sawing logs big time. And John and I, I mean, wow, he must have been really tired. And before we knew it, all I knew was Jesus was shaking us Hey, wake up, wake up. Couldn't you even just pray for a little bit? And, and I looked in his face, and I mean, have you ever been woke up from a nap? I mean, I, I, sometimes I can, can be a little grumpy when I wake up from a nap. And I was like, look, I'm kind of in a daze. Where am I? It's dark. I mean, it's kind of cold. And Jesus is shaking me. And uh, Okay, and I'm, what's going on? And oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we were praying. That's what, that's what we were doing. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I don't know what came over us, but we just... Got sleepy or something. I don't know. I mean, got our bellies full from the Passover feast, and now we're. <laughs> and it's night and dark, and 
kind of nice and yeah, kind of got sleepy. Sorry about that, Lord. And, but his face, it, it, it looked like he was even sweating. And, and let me, it was kind of chilly that night. And it, to be honest, it was hard to see because it was dark, but it almost looked like he had like sweat, like it almost looked like blood on his face, but like sweat droplets. I've never seen that any, on anybody. And I'm like, are you okay? But I didn't want to say anything because, you know, we had just fallen asleep. So, like, I'm sorry, Master. And so we went back to praying. And he went back to pray. And we fell asleep again. Oh. And he woke us up again. And then prayed. And we did this. And then finally the last time he came back to us. And he said, he woke us up. And he's like, well, time has come. The hour has come. And I'm like, uh, it's come for what? Time to go home? <laughs> and uh, then all of a sudden we heard the sound of, like, swords and spears and we saw it, a glow coming into the garden. I'm like, that's kind of weird at this time of night. Now, the Romans were kind of over us, and we were hopeful. I mean, Jesus was our Messiah, and, and I, I had full hope in Jesus that he was going to deliver us from Rome. And how glorious that day was going to be. And so I was thinking, well, maybe today's the day. They're coming, and Jesus is going to really put them in their place. And they came marching up. They came closer and closer and closer to us. I was like, whoa, they really mean business. And I'm like, what's going on? And Jesus didn't seem to be concerned. He just stood there. And they came up. And as, as they got closer, we could kind of make out the, the figures. And there's some of the religious leaders and the Romans. And you'll never believe who was leading the pack. It was Judas. One of the guys that had followed Jesus with, with myself and all the other disciples for the last three years. Judas is scared. He was leading the pack. And at first I was like, oh, it's just Judas. And so it's fine. Friendly thing. Well, Judas came up, said nothing. And he came up and he kissed Jesus on the side of his face, on the cheek. And, and let me tell you, it wasn't like good to see a kiss. It was a kiss of betrayal. And I could have slugged him right then, let me tell you. And I was like, what is your deal, dude? Like, you've seen everything that I've seen him do. Why in the world are you delivering him over to these horrible men? That all they try to do is, is make our lives impossible all this time. And they get all bent out of shape when, we, when Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath. I mean, come on. And, the, and the, why are you going along with them? And Judas didn't really say anything. And, and he dropped back. And, and I was not going to let anything happen. I was the rock. Peter. Jesus called me the rock. So it was my duty to defend him. Jesus did nothing. So I drew my sword. And I went to hit one of the guys, and I, I was fully intending to kill him, okay? Let me just tell you, but I, he moved, he moved at the last minute, and I caught off, cut his ear off, and the guy instantly dropped to his, his feet, and Jesus said, put your sword away, Peter. Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And I was like, Jesus, don't you want to defend yourself? Aren't you going to defend yourself against these guys? Like, you're not just going to let them take you peaceably, are you? And then what Jesus did next, I'll never believe. This, this guy was coming to arrest Jesus, and I just cut off his, his ear, and I was kind of wishing I'd done a little bit more. And Jesus picked up his ear, and I was like, ew, don't touch that. I mean, you never know where that's been. And he picked it up, and he went up to the man, and instead of punching him like I wanted to do, he, he placed the ear gently on the man's head. And as he took his hand away, it was like it never had been cut off. No blood. And for me, it's like time stood still as all that took place. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. Well, then as soon as it's like his hand drew away slowly and the man looked and felt and there was no blood. It's like then it went back into real time. And then they, the men grabbed Jesus forcibly and they put chains around his wrist and they began dragging him out. And, and I was like, what's going on, John? And, and they started to grab, lay their hands on me, us. And I socked the guy real good. And, and John, they grabbed him, but he was able to get out of his coat and he ran away and, and we all fled. We didn't know what was going on. They took Jesus away. And we kind of followed a, a distance back. We didn't know what was going on. And so we, I followed and John was close with me and, and we came up and they brought him before the high priest and they were questioning him. And John knew some guys inside, so he had a kind of an inside ticket. And, but I stayed outside. And like I said, in the garden, it was kind of cold. It was kind of chilly. And, and so I was outside. I was warming my hands by the fire. And I mean, it, I was in my own world. I was in a daze. And I wasn't really focusing on anybody that was around me. And, and before, I, and I was just like, what is going on? Like, Jesus was just worshipped as we came into town just a week ago. And now 
they're arresting him for on a, like what charges? What are they, what is going to happen? Well, surely they're going to just let him go. I mean, they've made disruptions before, and I mean, it's just been it's blown off. But this seems a little different. Like they've got the Romans involved this time, and so I uh, I was kind of I was really concerned. But then all of a sudden, my thoughts got interrupted by a young servant girl. She came up and said, "Hey, you're you're one of his followers, aren't you?" And before I even knew what I was saying, I was like, "No, no, I'm I'm not one of his." And, and she's like, oh, oh, I'm, I thought for sure you, I saw you with him. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. And I was like, why did I just say that? What are you saying, Peter? What in the world? Like I, and then uh, some time progressed. And I, again, I was in deep in my thoughts. And somebody else asked. And, and again, I, I deny that I even knew him. And I was just inside. I was just blown away. But I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. Like, are they going to kill him? But. And then some time passed and somebody else said, no, I know for sure. Like they were confident about it. like, you are one of his followers. I've seen you with him in, the, in your speech. Like I can tell you're, you're one of his. And I'm ashamed to say that I even, I even swore to prove to them that I wasn't a follower of Jesus. And I will never forget the next moment as long as I shall live. The worst image in my mind is as I, as I said that, that I don't even know the man. The rooster crowed, and the, the phrase Jesus had said the night before, that before the rooster crowed, I was going to deny that I even knew him three times. And I was Peter, the rock, the guy that he could always depend on. And I just denied, I mean, he's my best friend, but I just denied that I even knew him. And then as I looked up into the upper chamber, I saw Jesus. And he was standing there as people were accusing him and they couldn't get their story straight, but Jesus was standing there in chains, and he looked over at me, and our eyes met. And I'll never forget that look. As I was ashamed that I had even denied that I knew him, and I knew that he knew. I don't know how, but I knew that he knew. And he looked, and I, in my reaction to that, if I knew somebody had done that, I would be angry. My eyes would be, I'm going to get you when I get out of here. But Jesus looked at me with compassion, with love in his eyes, and with severe hurt. And I was like, I couldn't take it. I took, I took off running, and I, I just went, and I just wept. But as I ran, the thought hit me. I don't know what's going on, but as I'm running away, I don't know why I'm running, but as I'm running away from the man that has taught me so much, as I'm running away, that man is staying behind for some reason. To, to take my place for something. I don't understand. But there's something bigger going on here that I don't... That I know he's talked about some things that we didn't understand, but I don't know. But there's something bigger going on. Why did he stay and take in my place? As the hours passed by, it seemed like it, hours ticked by, and we were just questioning what's going to happen. Then we heard news that they... They said that he was accused of blaspheming God and by claiming he was the son of God, which I believed he was. But they didn't believe it. And in our Jewish tradition, the penalty of that is, is death. And I knew these guys didn't like Jesus. And I knew they wouldn't stop at anything to, to make sure that their agenda had followed through. But I was like, man, surely. I mean, Jesus has the power to, to heal the sick, to, to bring... He brought Lazarus back from the dead. Surely he can conquer them. I mean, Jesus is our answer to get deliverance from Rome. Surely it's going to work out. Well, they brought him before Pilate. Pilate didn't know what was going on. He didn't see anything wrong with Jesus. And, and so he sent him to Herod so he wouldn't have to deal with it. And Herod just made fun of him. And then they sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate came before the people. And again, he couldn't find anything wrong. But yet whenever he would question Jesus, they just like Jesus wouldn't respond. Or he just would be quiet. Or he just said, yeah, I am. And, and Pilate just didn't know what to do, but he, he wanted to please the people and, because he wanted to make sure he was back in that position later on. And, and they were twisting things on him to, that it could hurt him in his position. And, and I, I don't know what I would have done, I guess, if I, in that situation. But Pilate finally thought, hey, you know what? I always have that custom of delivering somebody during the time of Passover. And so he came before them and and I thought, hey, maybe this is a good idea. Maybe this will work and maybe Jesus will be delivered. And he said, hey, it's the time of year that I will deliver to you 
you one of the prisoners. And who would you have? Would you want me to deliver this king of the Jews? And I couldn't believe the words I heard next. I don't know who said it first, but somebody cried out, Give us Barabbas! And I was like, Barabbas? Like, of all people, Barabbas. I remember the day they finally got him convicted and threw him in prison. And that guy deserved to be in bars for the rest of his life. He was a thief, a robber, you name it, he's done it. And probably things that we don't even know he did. And Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas to run free on the streets. And Jesus, a guy that had healed the sick and had brought people back to life, had touched the blind and they could see again, and they want to kill him? And give Barabbas a free ticket out? That makes no sense. But then Pilate said, okay, you can have Barabbas. Well, what do you want to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. Now, mind you, these are the same people that were crying Hosanna the week before. And now they're crying crucify him. I was like, what's wrong with you guys? What's wrong? And they led him out and they scourged him. And they threw, the soldiers mocked him and they, they threw this crown of thorns on his, on his face and when he came out into the streets and they threw this rugged, horrible, heavy, splintery cross on his back after his back had been riddled. And, and I tell you, you could hardly recognize him. I knew it was him just because of everything that had progressed. But again, of everything that had progressed and what I had done to betray him, I, I just couldn't let him see me because I was so ashamed. And I wanted to do something, but I couldn't, didn't know what to do. And... And I was scared. I, I, I was just so torn as to what to do. And, and as he was led through the streets with the cross and, and he fell you, under the just severe loss of blood and weakened. I mean, most men don't even survive the scourging. And he went through a severe scourging more than any normal criminal does. And then the crown of thorns placed on his head and carrying this, 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 this cross, horrible cross. And they led him out of town to the hill of Gotha. And there they crucified. And I will never forget that moment. As I look on that hill and I see my best friend, but that man that I had followed for three years everywhere and all the things he had done, and I was so proud to be a part of that. But now he was hanging on a cross. And that man, I had seen him walk on the water and I'd seen him bring Lazarus back from the dead and I knew he had the power to come off that cross. And I was just waiting for the moment. Oh, he's going to show them. He's just, he's just, it's going to be a dramatic turnaround. And he's going to conquer them. And this is the day. This is the day we're going to be delivered from Roman rule. He's going to make this big dramatic change. He was crucified. They, they thought they had him. And now he's going to come back and rule. That's what I thought. When is it? Jesus, any moment now. You can do it. You can do this. And, but he didn't. And instead of doing that, I saw him... Just look across the crowd that was there that were still mocking him and spitting on him. And, and then he said something that I couldn't believe. I, he said, Father. He looked up in the sky. He said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Like, forgive them? Jesus, are you thinking straight? You're hanging on a cross. You're nailed to a cross. They beat you. Who's he talking about? Like, Who's this forgiveness for? Is it, is it for me? Is it even me? Like what I did, am I worthy for this forgiveness? And, and is it for the soldiers? Or who's this for? But yet Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. for what They know not what they do. Jesus still was showing love and compassion in the midst of severe pain and suffering. And I just was wondering, why is he doing this? Why? What's the purpose? And as I was still waiting for the moment that he would just pop off the cross and knock everybody out that had been against him. But then he said, it is finished. And then his body slumped. He died. And I was like, no. No. It can't be. It can't be. There was so much promise with this. There was, it can't end like this. It's, maybe he was saying, what does it is finished mean? Was that meaning that he just couldn't complete the work he came for, the purpose that he came for? Is that what he's talking about? I'll tell you, the sky grew dark 
as all of our hearts were aching. And it was in the middle of the day. And then the earth began to rumble. And I was like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. They took his body down and the man took him to a, a tomb. And the disciples, we kind of gathered back together. and We were just in shock. Jesus, we'd followed for three years. Every day, everywhere he went, we went. And this was the guy that we thought was going to deliver us from Rome. And he was the Messiah. And it's over. It's done. He's dead. And I'll tell you, the next few days were, were terrible. We just didn't really do anything. We were just standing, sitting, talking about stories that we had with Jesus. Remembering when he calmed the sea. He was by saying, peace, be still. And the sea calmed and... And when he called, oh man, I've mentioned this many times, but that moment when he called Lazarus from the dead. He'd been in the grave for four days and he called him from the dead. And, and he walked out of the grave. Now that was crazy. And man, it just, we just went on story. And oh, remember that one time? And oh, I remember his reaction. That was perfect. Oh, that was so funny. And it, trying to cheer, lift our spirits, but just so the daunting reality that he's gone. Three days had passed and we were somewhat scared for our lives because, I mean, people did know we had followed him everywhere. So when are they coming after us? Well, then one day, on the third day after his death, we were, we were meeting together and all of a sudden we heard this yelling and screaming. And, but it wasn't like a crying, weeping kind of yelling and screaming. It was like excitement kind of stuff. And, you know, when like ladies get together and they start whooping and hollering and you don't know exactly what's going on. And... Mary comes bursting into the room where we're at, and we're like, what is your problem? And she started saying, he's alive, he's alive. And we're like, who's alive? Uh, you just come bursting in the room, and we're kind of sad, you know. I mean, why are you excited? Why are you smiling right now? And, and she's like, Jesus, he's alive. I'm like, no, no way. And so John and I, we didn't waste any time. We took off for the tomb. We went to check it out for ourselves. And, and let me tell you, John said that he beat me to the tomb, but let me tell you, he's a good storyteller. He should write a book sometime because it was at least a tie. But John waited outside, but I went bursting into the tomb. And let me tell you, the, the, the grave clothes were there, but Jesus wasn't there. And the, the covering over his face, they call it a napkin. They, it was folded neatly. It didn't look like somebody had just come and taken his, didn't look like somebody had came to steal his body because they surely wouldn't have taken the time to fold his, the grave clothes. I mean, what? And... Instantly, John believed that he was alive. And we ran back, we were puzzled. I was still like, what? Trying to process everything that has taken place. I mean, this last week and a half has been insane. We came in, we were celebrated as celebrities, and then they crucified Jesus, and now he's gone. And, and what is going on? And, and we went back to talk with Mary, and Mary had said that after she, she was weeping because he was gone, and, and she was afraid somebody stole their body, and then... And, then the angel was there and said, he's alive. Go tell the disciples of Peter that he's alive. And she came and we were so excited. And as we were together, Jesus came into the room. And he appeared before us. And first we were wanting to make sure it was him. But then he asked for food and he ate. And didn't just like go all the way through it and like fall on the floor. It, it, was, it was in fact Jesus. He was there and we talked. And then he disappeared. He vanished. And Thomas happened to not be with us that day. And we told him about it. He's like, no way. There's no way. You guys are, have been, I mean, you're going through shock, and so you're just having daydreams. And I mean, Mary, she was the only one at the tomb when she claimed she saw Jesus. She was by herself, so I mean, she might have just been dreaming too, and just had this vision. There's, there's no way. The only way I'm going to believe that he's alive is if I can put my hand in, in the prince in his, in his hands and discard his side. That's what I'm going to believe, he's alive. And a few days later, he appeared again, and Thomas was with us. With us and his, like Jesus had heard that conversation because he said, Thomas. He walked directly to Thomas right away. Thomas, you see these scars in my hands? Scar on my side? Would you like to test it out, make sure it's real? And Thomas, like, he fell before him, humbled. Lord, I, I believe. And Jesus said, you must believe even without seeing. It's incredible. The next few days were just, I can't tell you the, the turnaround of our spirits, but the only thing that was, was still hard and difficult is that we used to follow Jesus everywhere. But now, I mean, it was awesome we had saw him, but, but yet we didn't know when he was coming. We didn't know when he was going to leave and when he was going to come back. And, and, that, and that anxiousness and anxiety about when that would happen was, was kind of annoying and frustrating. 
in. We just want to be with him. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. Finally, one day, I just had enough of being in the room. I'm just like, guys, I've got to get outside. How about we go fishing? We haven't fished for a while. And so, so the guys were like, yeah, let's go fishing. That sounds fun. So we went out to, the, to our boats, and we went out in the water. We hadn't done it for a little while, but I was like, I might be a little rusty, but I'm still got the touch. Let me tell you, we fished all night long and caught nothing. Not a thing. Not even one single bite. It's like, man, I knew it's been a while, but come on. And morning broke through, the sun began to rise. I'm like, man, I can't believe it's been all night and we haven't caught a thing. And all of a sudden there's a man on the shore. And he called out to us and said, hey, did you catch anything? I hate when you go fishing. And you know how everybody is. When you go fishing and they're like, hey, did you catch anything? Did they bite today? Uh, well, we're professional fishermen, and for somebody to ask us if we caught anything, and we fished all night long, and we caught nothing, that makes us look pretty bad. We're like, when he called out, did you catch anything? Like, if we had caught a bunch, like, yeah, we caught a bunch! But we're like, no, we didn't catch anything. And he's like, put your nets on the other side. Um, we fished, I think you forgot, you, you missed the whole part about us fishing all night, we didn't catch anything. Yeah, they're, they're not biting. And uh, it's not going to work. He's like, but all of a sudden, there's like deja vu. So this has happened before. And then John was like, hey, that's Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, that's all it took. The disciples, the other guys, they threw the nets over on the other side. And immediately they were filled. But I was on the other side, jumping overboard. And I swam to shore. Now, in all those other times where Jesus appeared to us, I was so excited that he was there. But at the same time, it, there was something that was hindering my He's like, there's something that, he didn't treat me any different, but yet I felt, what's the word? I just, I was ashamed that I, I had betrayed him. And I knew he knew, but he wasn't acting like anything was different, but yet we hadn't really talked about it. And before I knew it, I was at the shore and I was falling on his feet. He's like, Jesus, it's you. And, and the guys were bringing in the nets and, and I ran over there to pull in the nets at the last minute and to you know, get a little good, bit of the glory of, hey, I did something. And then we went back to the fire and Jesus already had fish and bread even. And it's like, why did you even want us to catch fish if you already had food for us? And then we talked and we ate and we had a wonderful time. And then as our meal was coming to an end, Jesus looked at me. He didn't call me Peter. He said, Simon. He hadn't called me that for a while. I'd, I kind of like the Peter. You know, that's... Solid. He's going to depend on me. He called me Simon again. Uh oh. Here's the conversation I've been dreading. He's like, Simon? <laughs> yes, Lord. He's like, Do you love me? It's like, Yeah. <laughs> you know I love you. And, I mean, did you see me jump overboard right now and swim to shore? The other guys didn't did that, do that. They just came in the ship. I jumped overboard. That was excitement, you know, that show some love for you. And, yeah, I love you. And he's like, um, Feed my lambs. I didn't even know you had livestock. Come on. And cool. And uh, he was like, no, Simon, do you love me? You already asked me that, Jesus. <laughs> uh, you, and I said, yes, so I, I do love you. And he's like, well, feed my sheep. Right on. Okay. I'll play along. Yeah. Okay, I'll feed your sheep. What sheep are you talking about? And then finally he looked at me and he said, Simon, do you love me? He's like, no, I was kind of getting a little ear. Are you listening to me? I, Jesus, I've told you I already love you twice. But, Lord, words cannot describe to you how much I love you. And you know that thing back there? I'm really sorry about betraying you that I even knew you. Like you said that would happen, but I didn't really think it would, but it did. And, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I'm really so sorry. And he stopped me. Peter, Peter, do you remember the day that Mary came back from the tomb? Yeah, I didn't remember that distinctly. We've been sobbing, and then all of a sudden she comes running, saying, Beehive, beehive, at least what I thought she said. And I was like, oh, beehive, I'm allergic, don't get me. And then turns out she was saying, he's alive, he's alive. And so then you were like, okay. So we go and check out the, the, the tomb, and we come back, and in fact, the, the tomb was empty. And then Mary tells us that when she was there, the, an angel was there, and, she, and they said, he is risen, do not be afraid, he is risen, he is alive. Go tell the disciples on Peter that he's alive. And so they came and ran, and and Jesus said, what, what, did, what did the angel say? And, and, well, uh, uh, yeah, we ran into the tomb. Yeah, go tell the disciples of Peter that he, he, you're alive and you're here. And we're, we're so excited that you're here. And he said, what did the angel say? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter. 
You said my name. And you said, Peter, why why'd you say my name? And he looked at me and said, Peter, that's my grace. <laughs> no, but Lord, I, I failed you. I failed you so many times. Like, remember the time on the water when I came out to you and then I, I took my eyes off you and I began to sink. And the other time when I opened my mouth and I shouldn't have. And the, those other times. And then the last time when I denied that I even knew you. But Lord, how can you? Why'd you say my name? Because that's how much I love you. I want you to follow me. No matter, it's not about what you've done. It's not about what you did. It's all about what I just did on the cross. And I just rose from the dead. Rose, conquered death, hell, and the grave. It's all about me, Peter. Not about you. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you feel like me, where you have failed him. Maybe you followed him at some point, And you failed multiple times. And you're ashamed. You're ashamed that you failed him so many times and you don't feel like he could ever love you anymore. And maybe you've never followed him, but you feel like just because of where you come from and all the things that you've done, there's no way that Jesus could ever love you. Well, remember what I told you about as he was hanging on the cross and how he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he knew what I had done and I knew what I had done. And that I didn't feel like there was any way he could forgive me. But yet right here he was standing, telling me that he specifically had my name said. He didn't say, go tell John, James, and Andrew, and, and, and Matt, Matthias, and all that. He didn't say all that. But he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. He said my name specifically for a reason. Because he loved me. And he loves you, too. And if you haven't asked him into your heart to... Accept him as your personal Savior, you can. He wants you to follow him. He came, I thought, to come and to conquer the Roman government. To, to free us from that oppression. And yet, when he said it is finished, I thought it was over. It's done. There's no hope. But when he said it is finished, he was talking about something much, much greater. The curse of sin that had been over us for centuries was now the, the, I heard that the, the veil rent in twain in the temple that only the, the holy the, the high priest could enter in on a certain day and he had to make sure that he was sanctified and, and, and purified that he could even enter in otherwise he, he could be struck down and that was rent in twain open for all to come what Jesus did on the cross drove the powers of Satan away, and it, it opened the access for us to have access back to the Father. That we can come before Him personally, and He is opening His arms. As, he's, as He was hanging on the cross, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. His arms were open for you and for me, for the entire world. He did that. He had the power to come off of that cross like I was hoping He would, but yet He chose to hold let those nails hold him on that cross because of how much love he had for you. You deserve to die. I deserve to die for my sin. But yet he loved me and you so much that he was willing to take the pain. And it doesn't make sense. When we think about when somebody's done something wrong, they deserve to pay for it. That's how, that's how we think. That's how we reason. And that makes sense. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, I want to take Pay the price because you can't. You can't. You can't cover the sin. It's only me. Only through me that you can have access back to the Father. And because I love you so much, I'm willing to go through this pain and suffering for you. Jesus loves you so much this morning. And if you have not asked him into your heart to accept him as your personal Savior, I encourage you to do so. That's what Easter is all about. It's not about bunnies. It's about Easter eggs. It's about Jesus. It's about all about Jesus. And it may seem like a gory thing to think about, but when we think about what he did for us, that's why we celebrate it. And the other thing is, he rose from the dead. He's alive today. And as he told me that he was praying for me, he's praying for you. Sitting at the side, right hand of the Father, says he's ever interceding on our behalf. He 
desires that each and every one of mankind will come to him and follow him. But it's our choice. He's already done everything that needs to be done for us to accept. All we have to do is accept it. And all we have to do is we recognize that we need him as a savior. And he is. That's, that's only, he's the only way. But if we recognize this and then we ask and we confess, we ask him to forgive us our sins, as I did. I was ashamed for what I had done. But yet he still forgave me, even though I didn't feel like I deserve it, and I didn't. But he still, does, he still granted me forgiveness, and he'll do the same for you. So if you haven't asked him into your life, and into your heart, to, and then accept him as your personal Savior, I encourage you to do so this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We celebrate. We thank you for the price that you paid on Calvary for us. We deserve to die for our sin, yet you chose to come, to come as a baby, to live a sinless life, and to pay the price for our sin, take our place. And thank you, Lord, for that that you've done for us. And thank you that we can, with, with what you've done on the cross, and if we accept you into our heart, that we can live with you forever. Lord, if there's anyone that is listening this morning that has not accepted you into their heart, maybe they've done so years back, but have turned their back on you and de denied you, betrayed you, Lord, we ask that you speak to their heart. And if they are willing to accept your gift of love, may they do so. And if they just confess their sins, we know that in your word you say that if you confess you are our sins before you, that you are faithful and just, and will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then all it is is a step of faith, and we believe that you've done the work in our lives and that we follow you day by day. We know that we can live with you eternally if we do that. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you for the gift of love that you love each and every one of us. Let us give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.